The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Introduction. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Introduction. We Americans devour eagerly any piece of writing that purports to tell us the secret of success in life. Yet how often we are disappointed to find nothing but commonplace statements, or recipes that we know by heart, but never follow. Most of the life stories of our famous and successful men fail to inspire us because they lack the human element that makes the story record real and brings the story within our grasp. While we are searching far and near for some Aladdin's lamp to give coveted fortune, there is ready at our hand, if we will only reach out and take it, like the charm in Milton's Comus, unknown and like esteemed and dull swain, treads on it daily with his clouted shoon. The interesting, human, and vividly told story of one of the wisest and most useful lives in our history, and perhaps in any history, in Franklin's autobiography, is offered not so much a ready-made formula for success as the companionship of a real flesh-and-blood man of extraordinary mind and quality, whose daily walk and conversation will help us to meet our own difficulties much as does the example of a wise and strong friend. While we are fascinated by the story, we absorb the human experience through which a strong and helpful character is building. The thing that makes Franklin's autobiography different from every other life story of a great and successful man is just this human aspect of the account. Franklin told the story of his life, as he himself says, for the benefit of his posterity. He wanted to help them by the relation of his own rise from obscurity and poverty to eminence and wealth. He is not unmindful of the importance of his public services and their recognition, yet his accounts of these achievements are given only as a part of the story, and the vanity displayed is incidental and in keeping with the honesty of the recital. There is nothing of the impossible in the method and practice of Franklin as he sets them forth. The youth who reads the fascinating story is astonished to find that Franklin in his early years struggled with the same everyday passions and difficulties that he himself experiences, and he loses the sense of discouragement that comes from a realization of his own shortcomings and inability to attain. There are other reasons why the autobiography should be an intimate friend of American young people. Here they may establish a close relationship with one of the foremost Americans, as well as one of the wisest men of his age. The life of Benjamin Franklin is of importance to every American, primarily because of the part he played in securing the independence of the United States and in establishing it as a nation. Franklin shares with Washington the honors of the Revolution and the events leading to the birth of the new nation. While Washington was the animating spirit of the struggle in the colonies, Franklin was its ablest champion abroad. To Franklin's cogent reasoning and keen satire, we owe the clear and forcible presentation of the American case in England and France. While to his personality and diplomacy, as well as his facile pen, we are indebted for the foreign alliance and the funds without which Washington's work must have failed. His patience, fortitude, and practical wisdom, coupled with self-sacrificing devotion to the cause of his country, are hardly less noticeable than similar qualities displayed by Washington. In fact, Franklin as a public man was much like Washington, especially in the entire disinterestedness of his public service. Franklin is also interesting to us because by his life and teachings he has done more than any other American to advance the material prosperity of his countrymen. It is said that his widely and faithfully read maxims made Philadelphia and Pennsylvania wealthy, while poor Richard's pithy sayings, translated into many languages, have had a worldwide influence. 
Franklin is a good type of our American manhood. Although not the wealthiest or the most powerful, he is undoubtedly, in the versatility of his genius and achievements, the greatest of our self-made men. The simple yet graphic story in the autobiography of his steady rise from humble boyhood in a tallow chandler shop, by industry, economy, and perseverance in self-improvement, to eminence, is the most remarkable of all the remarkable histories of our self-made men. It is in itself a wonderful illustration of the results possible to be attained in a land of unequalled opportunity by following Franklin's maxims. Franklin's fame, however, was not confined to his own country. Although he lived in a century notable for the rapid evolution of scientific and political thought and activity, yet no less a keen judge and critic than Lord Jeffrey, the famous editor of the Edinburgh Review, a century ago, said that, in one point of view, the name of Franklin must be considered as standing higher than any of the others which illustrated the eighteenth century. Distinguished as a statesman, he was equally great as a philosopher, thus uniting in himself a rare degree of excellence in both these pursuits, to excel in either of which is deemed the highest praise. Franklin has indeed been aptly called many-sided. He was eminent in science and public service, in diplomacy and in literature. He was the Edison of his day, turning his scientific discoveries to the benefit of his fellow men. He perceived the identity of lightning and electricity, and set up the lightning rod. He invented the Franklin stove, still widely used, and refused to patent it. He possessed a masterly shrewdness in business and practical affairs. Carlyle called him the father of all the Yankees. He founded a fire company, assisted in founding a hospital, and improved the cleaning and lighting of streets. He developed journalism established the American Philosophical Society, the Public Library in Philadelphia, and the University of Pennsylvania. He organized a postal system for the colonies, which was the basis of the present United States Post Office. Bancroft, the eminent historian, called him the greatest diplomat of his century. He perfected the Albany Plan of Union for the colonies. He is the only statesman who signed the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Alliance with France, the Treaty of Peace with England, and the Constitution. As a writer, he has produced, in his autobiography and in Poor Richard's Almanac, two works that are not surpassed by similar writing. He received honorary degrees from Harvard and Yale, from Oxford and St. Andrews, and was made a Fellow of the Royal Society, which awarded him the Copley Gold Medal for improving natural knowledge. He was one of the eight foreign associates of the French Academy of Science. The careful study of the autobiography is also valuable because of the style in which it is written. If Robert Louis Stevenson is right in believing that his remarkable style was acquired by imitation, then the youth who would gain the power to express his ideas clearly, forcibly, and interestingly cannot do better than to study Franklin's method. Franklin's fame in the scientific world was due almost as much to his modest, simple, and sincere manner of presenting his discoveries, and to the precision and clearness of the style in which he described his experiments, as to the results he was able to announce. Sir David Humphrey, the celebrated English chemist, himself an excellent literary critic, as well as a great scientist, said, a singular felicity guided all Franklin's researches, and by very small means he established very grand truths. The style and manner of his publication on electricity are almost as worthy of admiration as the doctrine it contains. Franklin's place in literature is hard to determine because he was not primarily a literary man. His aim in his writings, as in his life work, was to be helpful to his fellow men. For him writing was never an end in itself, but always means to an end. Yet his success as a scientist, a statesman, and a diplomat, as well as socially, was in no little part due to his ability as a writer. His letters charmed all and made his correspondence eagerly sought. His political arguments were the joy of his party and the dread of his opponents. His scientific discoveries were explained in language at once so simple and so clear that ploughboy and exquisite could follow his thought 
or his experiment to its conclusion as far as american literature is concerned franklin has no contemporaries before the autobiography only one literary work of importance had been produced in this country cotton mather's magnalia a church history of new england in a ponderous stiff style franklin was the first american author to gain wide and permanent reputation in europe the autobiography poor richard father abraham's speech or the way to wealth as well as some of the bagatelles are as widely known abroad as any american writings franklin must also be classed as the first american humorist english literature of the eighteenth century was characterized by the development of prose periodical literature reached its perfection early in the century in the tatler and the spectator of addison and steele pamphleteers flourished throughout the period the homelier prose of bunyan and defoe gradually gave place to the more elegant and artificial language of samuel johnson who set the standard for prose writing from seventeen forty five onward this century saw the beginnings of the modern novel in fielding's tom jones richardson's clarissa harlowe stern's tristram shanty and goldsmith's vicar of wakefield gibbon wrote the decline and fall of the roman empire hume his history of england and adam smith the wealth of nations in the simplicity and vigor of his style franklin more nearly resembles the earlier group of writers in his first essay he was not an inferior imitator of addison in his numerous parables moral allegories and apologies he showed bunyan's influence but franklin was essentially a journalist in his swift terse style he is most like defoe who was the first great english journalist and master of the newspaper narrative the style of both writers is marked by homely vigorous expression satire burlesque repartee here the comparison must end defoe and his contemporaries were authors their vocation was writing and their success rests on the imaginative or creative powers they displayed to authorship franklin laid no claim he wrote no work of the imagination he developed only incidentally a style in many respects as remarkable as that of his english contemporaries he wrote the best autobiography in existence one of the most widely known collections of maxims and an unsurpassed series of political and social satires because he was a man of unusual scope of power and usefulness who knew how to tell his fellow men the secrets of that power and usefulness the story of the autobiography the account of how franklin's autobiography came to be written and the adventures of the original manuscript forms in itself an interesting story the autobiography is franklin's longest work and yet it is only a fragment the first part written as a letter to his son william franklin was not intended for publication and the composition is more informal and the narrative more personal than in the second part from seventeen thirty on which was written with a view to publication the entire manuscript shows little evidence of revision in fact the expression is so homely and natural that his grandson william temple franklin in editing the work changed some of the phrases because he thought them inelegant and vulgar franklin began the story of his life while on a visit to his friend bishop shipley at twyford in hampshire southern england in seventeen seventy one he took the manuscript completed to seventeen thirty one with him when he returned to philadelphia in seventeen seventy five it was left there with his other papers when he went to france in the following year and disappeared during the confusion incident to the revolution twenty-three pages of closely written manuscript fell into the hands of abel james an old friend who sent a copy to franklin at passe near paris urging him to complete the story franklin took up the work at passe in seventeen eighty four and carried the narrative forward a few months he changed the plan to meet his new purpose of writing to benefit the younger reader his work was soon interrupted and was not resumed until seventeen eighty eight when he was at home in philadelphia he was now old infirm and suffering and was still engaged in public service under these discouraging conditions the work progressed slowly it finally stopped when the narrative reached the year seventeen fifty seven copies of the manuscript were sent to friends of franklin in england and france 
among others to Monsieur Le Villard at Paris. The first edition of the autobiography was published in French at Paris in 1791. It was clumsily and carelessly translated, and was imperfect and unfinished. Where the translator got the manuscript is not known. Le Villard disclaimed any knowledge of the publication from this faulty French edition. Many others were printed, some in Germany, two in England, and another in France. So great was the demand for the work. In the meantime, the original manuscript of the autobiography had started on a varied and adventurous career. It was left by Franklin with his other works to his grandson, William Temple Franklin, whom Franklin designated as his literary executioner. When Temple Franklin came to publish his grandfather's works in 1817, he sent the original manuscript of the autobiography to the daughter of Le Veillon in exchange for her father's copy, probably thinking the clearer transcript would make better printer's copy. The original manuscript thus found its way to the Le Veillon family and connections where it remained until sold in 1867 to Mr. John Bigelow, United States Minister to France. By him it was later sold to Mr. E. Dwight Church of New York, and passed, with the rest of Mr. Church's library, into the possession of Mr. Henry E. Huntington. The original manuscript of Franklin's autobiography now rests in the vault in Mr. Huntington's residence at Fifth Avenue and 57th Street, New York City. When Mr. Bigelow came to examine his purchase, he was astonished to find what people had been reading for years as the authentic Life of Benjamin Franklin by himself was only a garbled and incomplete version of the real autobiography. Temple Franklin had taken unwarranted liberties with the original. Mr. Bigelow says he found more than 1,200 changes in the text. In 1868, therefore, Mr. Bigelow published the standard edition of Franklin's autobiography. It corrected errors in the previous editions, and was the first English edition to contain the short fourth part, comprising the last few pages of the manuscript, written during the last year of Franklin's life. Mr. Bigelow republished the autobiography, with additional interesting matter, in three volumes in 1875, in 1905, and in 1910. The text in this volume is that of Mr. Bigelow's editions. For the divisions into chapters, and the chapter titles, however, the present editor is responsible. The autobiography has been reprinted in the United States many scores of times, and translated into all the languages of Europe. It has never lost its popularity, and is still in constant demand at circulating libraries. The reason for this popularity is not far to seek, for in this work Franklin told in a remarkable manner the story of a remarkable life. He displayed hard common sense and a practical knowledge of the art of living. He selected and arranged his material, perhaps unconsciously, with an unerring instinct of the journalist for the best effects. His success is not a little due to his plain, clear, vigorous English. He used short sentences and words, homely expressions, apt illustrations, and pointed allusions. Franklin had a most interesting, varied, and unusual life. He was one of the greatest conversationalists of his time. His book is the record of that unusual life told in Franklin's own unexcelled conversational style. It is said that the best parts of Boswell's famous biography of Samuel Johnson are those parts where Boswell permits Johnson to tell his own story. In the autobiography, a no less remarkable man and talker than Samuel Johnson is telling his own story throughout. F.W.P. The Gilman Country School, Baltimore, September 1916. End of Introduction